All right. So here's what we're talking about tonight. Implied volatility, historical volatility, expected move. So let me give you a little perspective uh, from, from my set of eyes. When I got started with this, all these new terminologies and these, these things that I knew nothing about, I needed some definition. I needed to understand how did they, how did those numbers show up? What did they mean? Where did they come from? Having uh, originated my career as a CPA, I needed for things to add up. Tick, tie, balance sheets, got to balance, all nine yards. And when I got into an applied volatility, it, it just completely confused me because it, it got into black shoals and it got into calculations that I couldn't put a pencil and a paper to to figure out, OK, how does it how does it get there? What does it mean? So I'm not going to get you there on pencil and paper tonight completely, but I'm going to get you partway there and then we'll talk about how I use this myself. So implied volatility, and this is what I'm talking about. So on Tasty Trade and Thinkorswim, generally it's the same thing. You know, you guys know what this is. This is an option chain for Federal Express. And where I've got that is 47 days. The implied volatility is 30.7, and the expected move for that same period of time is 18.47 points. So when I first got started, and even today, I, sometimes I have to go back and look at these definitions and figure out what, what are they, how do they work, what does it mean, how does it apply to me, why is it important to me, and all those good, good things. So let's just talk about how and what do these numbers mean and then how we apply them. So here we go. All right, so I'm going to put up a couple definitions of implied volatility. I'm going to be very boring, and I'm going to read them, but absorb each one of these definitions, if you will. And, and so you might end up in the same confused mode that I was when I first saw these, these definitions. This one comes right off of think or swim, implied volatility, a measure of market sentiment regarding the security's potential movement. So, okay, sounds logical. But as a CPA goes and a number guy goes, that that just didn't do it for me. So I, I don't know how, well, how do you measure market sentiment? And, and what does that mean? So let's go to the next definition of implied volatility. A little bit more, implied volatility represents the expected volatility of a stock over the life of the option. As expectations rise or as the demand for the option increases, implied volatility will rise. Options that have high levels of implied volatility will, will result in high priced options, premiums. Okay, so it gets a little bit more definitional, but it still doesn't get to where, okay, how the heck do you compute this thing and what, what does it really mean? If you take away anything from that definition, take away that when you see a higher volatility, volatility percentage compared to another another underlying or another expiration period, know that the prices of those options in that chain are going to be higher or higher priced in a relative perspective compared to others that have an implied volatility that's lower on a percentage basis. Okay, so that gets me there a little bit further, a little bit further. Let's go, let's go one more. Implied vol, and I pulled these off the net, just lots of random places right off the right off the internet. Implied volatility refers to the volatility of, a, of an underlying asset. Notice how they use volatility in the definition of it. Hard for me. Which will return the theoretical value of an option equal to the option's current market price. Hmm. It, here's the key on this one. Implied volatility is a key parameter in option pricing. It provides a forward-looking aspect of possible future price fluctuations. Okay, so kind of consistent, a little bit more complicated. Now let's go to one more, one more definition. So while we can measure a stock's past movement, historical volatility, new concept, while we can measure a stock's historical volatility, past movement, nobody knows the future movement of a stock price. That always stunted me. It's like, okay, if you don't know, what the heck is it? That means that the market produces an implied estimate for future volatility, key, key point here, baked into the current market price of options. So the last line, here it is. 
simplified implied volatility this value implied volatility is therefore the price of an option observed in the market at any given point in time so that's a circular definition but just stay with me i'm going to show you a mathematical equation and maybe it'll all kind of tie together but when you see the price of an option for a call or a put it's market driven, right? It's what the buyers and sellers are willing to pay or willing to spend. So it, it, that implied volatility percentage is actually being used to calculate the price of those options. Said another way from an algebraic perspective, the market price, the what a willing buyer and seller are willing to price an option at are actually can be used to figure out what the volatility of the stock is or the option. So credit where credit is due. If you wanna see a five minute explanation of implied volatility all the way down to the Black-Scholes formula by the Khan Academy, just Google Black-Scholes formula. If you can't find this particular link, email me and I'll send it to you. I'm not gonna play that five minutes. It, it, it gets a little complicated, but here's kind of the key Here's kind of the key to implied volatility. It's a black shoulder, it, many ways of, of computing it, but one major way is the black shoulder's formula. And these are the five inputs. One, two, three, four, five. Stock price, piece of cake, you got it. Exercise price, okay, strike, strike price of your contract. Risk-free interest rate, so think bonds, think go out to various places and find the 10-year treasury bond, so forth and so on. Time to expiration, e easy, right? Super, super easy. Here's where we get challenging. Well, I can't plug this into my formula, into the Ernie Rapp Excel spreadsheets and say, what is the standard deviation of the logarithmic, logarithmic returns for, for volatility? That just doesn't do it. And when you go in, when, when you hear Saul Khan, explain this. He basically says, well, wait a minute, let's break this down. So this is the Black-Scholes formula. Notice that D1 has a big definition down here. We're not going to go into that. And D2 has a big definition down here like that. So again, I promise you we're not doing, we're not doing statistics, but let's just look at this formula. This is actually for a European call. I guess there are lots of different exact formulas but this is how to how to do a implied volatility pricing of a of a european based call european call european options are the ones that can only be exercised at the expiration date as opposed to american options so look at look at the equation now we're going to get into some algebra real quick so the price of a call that's the c the price of a call is equal to this fan, fancy formula so all of this information down here and including this are in the inputs related to here. So if you know anything about algebra, you know that if you have five of six pieces, one, two, three, four, five, you can solve for the sixth. So it, it's essentially in a circular way if you have the market price of a call, the buyer and seller saying it, that's what they are willing to pay for it, and the stock price, the exercise price, and the risk-free rate, interest rate, and the time to expire, the standard deviation or the implied volatility of the logarithmic returns is going to give you implied volatility. So if that's, if that's clear as mud, I apologize, but I thought I'd give you kind of way down into the, into the bowels of implied volatility. And for my engineers and statisticians, if I'm butchering it, you know, I'm sorry, but this is the Ernie Rapp method of explaining it. So, so now let's look forward in kind of real terms. Up there in the left-hand corner, I pulled these off the, the Thinkorswim or Tasty Works earlier today. These were the closing prices of Accenture and FedEx, 289.97, 290.31. So essentially the same price within 34 cents of each other. So now let's take a look at Accenture. And we are looking at 
the June 47 days to go, implied volatility 23.7% with an expected move of 19.45. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to expected move in a minute. Now let's look at Federal Express. Again, same darn price, same, same, same darn price, just within pennies of each other. What's its 47 day, same period, implied volatility, seven plus points higher, expected move a little bit higher. Now let's just look in practical terms at the price of the 290 strike for each one of those. Notice the difference, 75790 with an implied volatility of 23%, 1095, 1120 for implied volatility of 30. So the underlines are the same. Implied volatility is different. So buyers and sellers are suggesting that the price of the 290 strike, it, you, they're willing to pay more or willing to sell it for that price. You're effectively getting implied volatility by the market value and all the other pieces and the components of that Black Scholes um, formula handed to you on the platforms, both Thinkorswim, Tastyworks, and I'm sure the other the other ones the other ones do. But that's a real that's a real roundabout way of saying as you see different implied volatility levels, percentages like that, you're automatically or you should automatically know just based upon looking at different underlyings and looking at different option chains that if something's price if something's got an implied volatility of 23 versus a 30, you should automatically know all things else being considered, right? The price of those options are going to be higher if the implied volatility is higher. Okay, hope that's hope that's kind of clear. All right, now let's go to historical volatility. So it's different. It, it's different. Let's look at the definitions real quick. Attempts to measure a security's potential price movement based upon the ranges of price movement a, a security has historically shown. Now here, this is going to be a pure math. There's no sentiment in this whatsoever. No math. This is pure math. Pure, pure math. Now what I'm not going to do is go down each one of these line items. This is how you compute uh, historical volatility. But to me, that's a bunch of gibberish. Here's an example. And I'm going to run through this super, super quick. Just I won't do the calculations. They do them for us. But let's just take a look at this. Let's figure out the historical volatility of ABC Corp over the last four days. What do we need? What are the closing stock prices for the last four days? Piece of cake. Let's take them. Let's add them up. Let's divide by four. Let's get an average. Got it. Let's calculate the difference between each price and the average price. So there's the first day, 10 minus the average, minus 125, so forth and so on. So now we have the differences between the prices and the averages. Let's come up here. Now let's take the square the difference. What's the square of minus 125? equals 156. What's the square of 0.75? 0 0.56, so forth and so on. Now we're going to sum the squares. We're going to take these four numbers. We're going to add them all up. Okay, 14.75. That's what's called the variance. We're going to divide the variance by four, four days, 3.69. What's the standard deviation? The standard deviation is the square root of 3.69 or 1.92. So when you see an expected move, this is effectively the calculation that the computer is giving you in rough approximations that the ABC Corp during the time to expiration on that chain has a plus or minus 192. Pure math, pure math. For me as a CPA, I love that one. And it's like, I'm not gonna sit there and compute them, but I'm glad to know and I can understand most of this math right very quickly. I'm not going to do square roots and standard deviations in my head, but I know I can get there if I had to. So that's historical volatility. But just think of this calculation being used with, with the implied volatility in the pricing of the option to get the expected move.
All right, so there's the expected move. Let's just read this together. The expected move represents the expected market movement range for underlying for the future. More specifically, it's the future range of a stock's price at one standard deviation. So for those of you who don't understand standard deviations, 68%, it says it right here. It's a statistical measure by using probabilities mathematicians can calculate, calculate, can't talk tonight, the likelihood of an outcome relative to the average possible outcome. So when we talk about one standard deviation, that expected move, it's likely for the ABC Corp 1.92 is the one standard deviation move 68% of the time during that, that period to expiration on that option chain, the stock is likely to move 1.92 up or 1.92 down. Two standard deviations is roughly 95%. Three standard deviations, 99%. So when, when you guys talk about the five delta, or when you talk, when you see me saying got a 95% probability of profit on some of these naked puts, I'm out two standard deviations. Expected move. The simplest way. This is funny. The simplest way to determine the expected move is to get it off the option chain on your broker platform, which we all do. What's a proxy for that? So here's a simple way to calculate it yourself to make sure to keep the brokers and the, and the uh, platforms honest. You can mathematically get close to, not exact, but close to by looking at the pricing of an at the money straddle. What are you going to do? You're going to sell a call and you're going to sell a put at the money. You're going to add those two prices together and you're going to look at that as an expected move and compare, compare that to what the brokerage or the option chain is showing you on the platform. Let's look at it. Let's look at an example. It's kind of a reasonable estimate. So here's FedEx, Tasty, Tasty Works platform. Right. We've we we've seen that it's got a 30 implied volatility with expected move of 18.47. OK, so bingo. I just kind of follow the arrows. Now I opened up the option chain. Right. Same stuff. Here's at the money, the bid and the ask above and below, above and below. And so I did it four different ways. Right. I did I did above and below. The bid and the ask, the bid and the ask. I added each one of them up, and you know what's the proxy there, right? 22, 22.85, 22.20, 23.55, 24.15. Close enough for a hand grenade to 18.47. Okay, so if you're ever in doubt of what the the uh, platform is giving you as an expected move, do the math. You know, add two two of these guys up. On a straddle, sell both sides, and you'll get you'll get a number that will roughly tell you if you're in the ballpark. And again, because it's sentiment and it's changing when the market's open, it's changing constantly. Those numbers are being updated, you know, instantaneously. How fast it makes it to your platform and what number you see is based upon obviously a lot of information coming into the platform. So expected move. Showed you the math, showed you the math behind the historical implied volatility. I did that so that you could generally get a feel for how implied volatility is being calculated, if you will, once it's using the market value that's being dictated by the buyers and sellers in the marketplace. So implied volatility, historical volatility, expected move. Now, most of us use that expected, expected move pretty, uh, pretty uh, intentfully, right? When we're setting up our deltas and we're making sure, especially as we get to the 15 day and less to expiration, we always want to make sure we're outside of the quote unquote expected move. 